Muhammad in the Bible by David Benjamin Keldani Whose son is the Messiah? Now I come to David's prophecy YHWH said to my Lord, Sit at my right until I place thine enemies a footstool under thy feet. This verse of David is written in Psalm 110, and quoted by Matthew 22 verse 44, Mark 12 verse 36, and Luke 20 verse 42. In all languages the two names contained in the first distich are rendered as, The Lord said unto my Lord. Of course, if the first Lord is God, the second Lord is also God, nothing more convenient to and suitable an argument for a Christian priest or pastor than this, namely, the speaker is God, and also the spoken to is God, therefore David knows two gods. Nothing more logical than this reasoning. Which of these two domini is, the Lord, of David? Had David written, Dominus meus dixit domino mio, he would have made himself ridiculous, for then he would have admitted himself to be a slave or servant of two lords, without even mentioning their proper names. The admission would go even farther than the existence of two lords, it would mean that David's second lord had taken refuge with his first lord, who ordered him to take a seat on his right side until he should put his enemies a footstool under his feet. This reasoning leads us to admit that, in order to understand well your religion, you are obliged to know your Bible or Quran in the original language in which it was written, and not to depend and rely upon a translation. I have purposely written the original Hebrew words YHWH, in order to avoid any ambiguity and misunderstanding in the sense conveyed by them. Such sacred names written in religious scripture should be left as they are, unless you can find a thoroughly equivalent word for them in the language into which you wish to translate them. The tetragram YHWH used to be pronounced Jehovah, but now it is generally pronounced Yahweh. It is a proper name of God the Almighty, and it is held so holy by the Jews that when reading their scriptures they never pronounce it, but read it Adonai, instead. The other name, Elohim, is always pronounced, but Yahweh never. Why the Jews make this distinction between these two names of the same God is a question for itself, altogether outside the scope of our present subject. It may, however, in passing, be mentioned that Yahweh, unlike Elohim, is never used with pronominal suffixes, and seems to be a special name in Hebrew for the deity as the national god of the people of Israel. In fact, Elohim is the oldest name known to all Semites, and in order to give a special character to the conception of the true God, this tetragram is often conjointly with Elohim applied to him. Consequently the first part of the distich is to be rendered as, God said to my Lord. David, in his capacity of a monarch, was himself the Lord and commander of every Israelite and the master of the kingdom. Whose servant was he, then? David, being a powerful sovereign, could not be, as a matter of fact, a slave or servant of any living human being whatsoever. Nor is it imaginable that he would call his Lord any dead prophet or saint, such as Abraham or Jacob, for whom the usual and reasonable term was, Father. It is equally conceivable that David would not use the appellation, My Lord, for any of his own descendants, for whom, too, the usual term would be, Son. There remains, besides God, no other conceivable being who could be David's Lord, except the noblest and the highest man of the race of mankind. It is quite intelligible to think that in the sight and choice of God there must be a man who is the noblest, the most praised, and the most coveted of all men. Surely the seers and the prophets of old knew this holy personage and, like David, called him, My Lord. Of course, the Jewish rabbins and commentators of the Old Testament understood by this expression the Messiah, who would descend from David himself, and so replied they to the question put to them by Jesus Christ as quoted above from Matthew 22, and the other synoptic. Jesus flatly repudiated the Jews when he asked them a second question, how could David call him, my Lord, if he were his son? This question of the Master put the audience to silence, for they could find no answer to it. The evangelists abruptly cut short this important subject of discussion. To stop there without a further explanation was not worthy either of the master or of his reporters. For, leaving the question of his Godhead, and even of his prophetical character, aside, Jesus as a teacher was obliged to solve the problem raised by himself when he saw that the disciples and the hearers were unable to know who then that, Lord, could be. 
By his expression that the Lord could not be a son of David, Jesus excludes himself from that title. This admission is decisive and should awaken the religious teachers of the Christians to reduce Christ to his due status of a high and holy servant of God, and to renounce the extravagant divine character ascribed to him much to his own disgust and displeasure. I cannot imagine a teacher who, seeing his pupils unable to answer his question, should keep silent, unless he is himself ignorant like them and unable to give a solution to it. But Jesus was not either ignorant or a malevolent teacher. He was a prophet with a burning love to God and man. He did not leave the problem unsolved or the question without an answer. The Gospels of the Churches do not report the answer of Jesus to the question, Who was the Lord of David? There is no doubt that the prophetical eye of Daniel that saw in a wonderful vision the Son of Man who was Muhammad, was also the same prophetical eye of David. It was this most glorious and praised of men that was seen by the prophet Job 19 verse 2, as a, Savior, from the power of the devil. Was it, then, Muhammad whom David calls, my Lord? Let us see. The arguments in favor of Muhammad are decisive, they are so evident and explicit in the words of the Old Testament that one is astonished at the ignorance and the obstinacy of those who refuse to understand and obey. The greatest prophet, in the eyes of God and man, is not a great conqueror and destroyer of mankind, nor a holy recluse who spends his life in a cave or cell to meditate upon God only to save himself, but one who renders more good and service to mankind by bringing them into the light of the knowledge of the one true God, and by utterly destroying the power of the devil and his abominable idols and wicked institutions. It was Muhammad who bruised the head of the serpent, and that is why the Quran rightly calls the devil Iblis, namely, the bruised one. He purged the temple of the Kaaba and all Arabia of the idols, and gave light, religion, happiness, and power to the ignorant Arab idolaters, who in a short time spread that light into the four directions of the earth. In the service of God, the works and the success of Muhammad are incomparable and unrivaled. The prophets, saints, and martyrs form the army of God against the power of the devil, and Muhammad alone is decidedly the commander-in-chief of them all. He is, indeed, alone the Lord not only of David but of all the prophets, for he has purified Palestine and all the countries visited by Abraham of idolatry and foreign yoke. Since Jesus Christ admits that he himself was not the Lord of David, nor that the Messiah was to descend from David, there remains none other than Muhammad among the prophets to be the Lord of David. And when we come to compare the praiseworthy religious revolution that the noble son of Ishmael brought about in the world, with what all the thousands of prophets put together have achieved, we have to come to the conclusion that it is alone Muhammad who could deserve the meritorious title of Lord. How did David know that, Yahweh said to my Lord, Sit thou at my right until I put thine enemies a footstool under thy feet, and when did David hear this word of God? Christ himself gives the answer, namely, David in spirit wrote this. He saw Muhammad just as Daniel had seen him in Daniel 7, and St. Paul had seen him in 2 Corinthians 12, and many others had. Of course, this mystery of, sit thou at my right, is hidden from us. Yet we may safely conjecture that this official investiture with the honor of seating himself at the right of the throne of God, and therefore raised to the dignity of the Lord, not only of the prophets but of all the creatures, took place on the famous night journey of Muhammad to Paradise. The only principal objective to Muhammad's divine mission and superiority is his condemnation of the doctrine of the Trinity. But the Old Testament knows no other God besides Allah, and the Lord of David did not sit at the right hand of a triple God, but at that of the one Allah. Hence among the prophets who believed in and served Allah none was so great, and accomplished such a stupendous service for Allah and mankind, as Muhammad, upon whom be peace and blessings.